Thank you, Glenn. Didn't the band do a great job today? Good morning. Man, that was great. I didn't know if the six o'clock crew last night was even here. Thank you for saying good morning. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 45. Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 45. I'll be speaking to you this morning on this subject. Be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for. And while you're turning there, I want to share something uh, about myself. If you, if you don't mind, I want to share something, a little story uh, about myself with you. Um, I love being a pastor. I really do. There's nothing else like it in the world, to share the Lord with other people, to share what God is doing in your life with other people, to share your faith, to share your testimony, to serve others, and to tell others what God wants to do in and through their lives. There's absolutely nothing else like it. It's great. Love it. But just because I'm a pastor doesn't exempt me from other passions like each one of you have. In one corner of my life, is this passion for something called basketball. I absolutely love it. Can't play it, but I absolutely love it. When it gets cold and there's that nip in the air like it is outside right now, it means three things. Thanksgiving, Christmas, and college basketball. Absolutely love this time of year. My wife hates this time of year because she knows I'm either going to be up at Castle High School watching the Knights play, in St. Louis watching the Bilkins play, or down at the Ford Center watching the Aces play. And uh, she, she knows that means that I'm going to be spending a little, little more time away from home. Uh, and by the way, if I can put in a little plug, I really think the Aces are going to be really good this year. So if you get a chance, they got it. And if, if you don't even like the Aces very much, go down there, take your kids. I mean, it'll be a study. It'll be a, a process and, uh, of international studies for you. They've got guys with names you've never heard of. Egidius Moskovicius and Mieslav Brozia. I mean, uh, you'll learn some, some interesting things. But in one corner, another corner of my life is a passion for something called politics. I'm fascinated with it. Absolutely love politics. Issues, uh, things that we face as a society, legislation, elections, different things. I am absolutely fascinated with it. Have been all my life. And there's been times when I looked up to God and I said, God, I'd really like to do this. I think you know I'd be good at it. I need you to make it happen. You ever done that? Yeah. Yeah, your passion may be a little bit different, but uh, you've done that. You know you have. You said, God, I want this. Now make it happen. And over the years, God's been pretty faithful of making it happen. God, uh, oh, about 18, 20 years ago or so, God opened up a door to work for a U.S. senator. He said, here you go, Chris, everything you've been praying for. But you know that girl you've been dating? I'd really like for her to be your wife. And if you take this job, that means moving to Washington and you'll probably never marry her. Now, my in-laws to be at the time were the ones saying, go, go, take the job. <laughs> They've already been to one service. They've already heard that story. So, And I think they actually like me now. But a few years later, had an opportunity to work for... Uh, a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, all excited about it, thinking about what it meant. God said, here you go, buddy, you can have it. But, you know that wife I gave to you? Taking this job means moving to Washington, and you're probably going to have a strange marriage, if not end up divorced. A few years later, we're living in Tennessee. And, yeah, you like that, huh? I heard that. Rocky Top's getting ready to be sung. <laughs> Living in Tennessee and gotten to know some people there and had an opportunity to work for a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from Tennessee. God said, here you go, buddy. You can have it. But 
You know that family I gave to you and that testimony of adoption and going overseas and getting those kids and all that? That beautiful wife I've given to you? You're probably not going to be able to support them the way I really want you to. But it's your choice. Take it or leave it. Now, I shared all of that last night at the 6 o'clock crew. Got home and my wife said, I guess I've been a little bit of a problem for you over the years, haven't I? <laughs> That's not really how I meant for the illustration to go. I share that with you this morning because I think it has something to do with what we'll see in the passages of Scripture that we'll look at today in Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 45. If you found that portion of Scripture, let's look at it together, beginning in verse 32. They were now on their way up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were filled with awe, and the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. Taking the twelve disciples aside, Jesus once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. And we could stop right there and have a message on those four words, couldn't we? Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What is your request, Jesus asked. And they replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh, yes, they replied, we're able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right hand or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it must be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life a ransom for many. If you're like me, over the last several weeks you've been listening uh, to what Dale's been preaching. You've been reading book by book, cha or chapter by chapter through the book of Mark, and you've seen some Jesus do some amazing things, have we not? Let's look at a graphic of the Sea of Galilee. We've watched as Jesus, through the first 10, 10 and a half chapters now, have gone, Jesus has gone throughout the Sea of Galilee area there, from that six by, inside that six by 20 mile radius area. He's gone from town to town, from east to west, from north to south. We've watched him as he's fed the thousands. We've watched him as he's, he's healed the sick. We've watched him as he's literally extracted demons out of people. We've watched him as he's told parables and, and confronted the Pharisees for their religiosity and their hardness of heart and their legalism. And then one of the neat things is after all of those things happen, what does Jesus do? On so many occasions, he pulls the disciples to the side in some remote area in that, in that Sea of Galilee area, in the mountains or somewhere, and says, hey, fellas, what'd you think about that? You got any questions? That's discipleship. Pulls them off and he answers questions for them. And the thing that I think about most when I look at this Sea of Galilee area, and I think about the influence that God the Father gave his son Jesus in that Sea of Galilee area, that place of influence for him. The thing that I think about most for me and the thing I think about, the question I think about for each one of you is this, where's your Sea of Galilee Where's your Sea of Galilee? Because I believe, friends, with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength that, that God has placed each one of you, he's placed me, all of us, if you're a child of the king, in a particular sphere of influence to make a difference for him. He's gifted you. If you're, if you're saved, God has given you all kinds of spiritual gifts. He's given you talents and skills and abilities to put to use for him, to make a difference in his kingdom, in your Sea of Galilee, where is it? 
God has placed you strategically in a certain family situation, in a certain business environment, maybe a political environment, environment or a government environment, maybe a sports environment. God has placed you strategically there for a purpose. So the thing I want you first to figure out today is where's your Sea of Galilee and what are you doing within it to make a difference for Jesus? The Bible says in verse 32, it says, they were now on their way up to Jerusalem. Now, you and I think about up. We, we read that and you think, well, they're heading north, like we would head north from Evansville. We head north to Vincennes or to Terre Haute or Indianapolis or Chicago. That's not what's happening here. You look at that map again. You see the, the arrow. If we can see the map, there, there it is, the Sea of Galilee, and that arrow follows the Jordan River to Jerusalem, 76 miles south to Jerusalem. The Sea of Galilee actually sits 700 feet, about 700 feet below sea level. Jerusalem, where they're headed, 76 miles away, sits about 2,500 feet above sea level. They have to climb up and out of that Sea of Galilee area, about 3,200 feet in elevation. On a typical day, what was the mode of operation, mode of transportation back then? They walked, they hoofed it. On a good day, depending on how many times they stopped and started and rested and talked and took breaks, they might be able to make it 20 miles a day. This was not like you and I getting in our car and going an hour trip, 76 miles. It took them about four or five days to make it to Jerusalem. And prior to this time, Jesus has told them on two separate occasions here in the Gospel of Mark, What's fixing to happen? What's going to happen to him? He tells him again, and these, these fellows, these folks that are following him, these disciples, they already know this. They've heard this. And it says here that they were filled with awe, and the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. They know exactly what they're heading to. Many of them do. And they've got some fear in their mind, in their heart. Jesus pulls them aside and tells them again what's fixing to happen. He says, listen, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of law, of the law. They're going to sentence him to die, hand him over to the Romans. They're going to mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip, and kill him. And after three days, he'll rise again. Now, when I look at that passage, one of the things I think about the most is this. After all said and done, Jesus has told them three times now what's fixing to happen. Guess who's leading the way? He is. <laughs> he was human, just like me and you. We saw in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was sweating blood. He, he even asked God, if this cup can pass for me, please let it pass. You know that he had those, 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 those fears and that anxiety of what was getting ready to take place, but yet, on their way to Jerusalem, who was leading the way? Jesus was. Friends, I want you to know today, some of you have walked in here and you've had a rough week. Some of you have gotten a diagnosis that's not good, and you're fearful of it. And I want you to know, based on Jesus' example here, you can face your fears just like he did. You, you can face your fears just like he did, as long as he is at the helm of your life. Some of you have walked in here today, and it doesn't look like you're going to have a job very much longer, and you're fearful of that. You're, you're anxious about that. Jesus' example here of him walking head first, leading the way towards his fears and what's getting ready to happen, helps us know that we can face our fears as well. Whether it's a job or a health situation or a family situation, you can face your fears as long as Jesus is at the helm of your life. It's after verse 34 that our story takes an interesting turn. Look at verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. You think their timing was just a little bit off? I mean, imagine the scene here. Jesus, the man who's supposed to be their best friend, the man who they've spent so much time with, the man who's invested in their life, the man who's discipled them, the man who they have seen do all of these things around the Sea of Galilee and they've learned so much for, the man who's invested in their life, just told them for the third time he's getting ready to die, and they find their way to slide up to him and say, hey, can we, can we ask you for a favor? 
Jesus has been talking about all he's about to give. And the disciples start to begin the process to lay out everything they want to get. I love Jesus' response in verse 36. What is your request, he asked. I particularly am fond of the NIV and the New King James Version. He says, what do you want me to do for you? He cuts to the chase. He knows exactly what they're getting ready to ask of him. He says, come on, guys, just lay it out there. What do you want me to do for you? I've just spent all this time with you, and I've just told you what's fixing to happen. Just cut to the chase. Tell me what you want. And they replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and one on your left. This is a continuation of chapter 9. You remember in chapter 9, whenever the disciples, they're all walking along the road, and Jesus is kind of keeping an eye on them, and he hears what's going on. They're all arguing about who's going to be the greatest among them. And here, James and John said, they, they get apart, they slide over apart next to Jesus, apart from the other disciples, and they say, hey, Jesus, can you forget about those other disciples just a little bit? Because we want to sit on your right hand and your left hand. Yeah, and and, and when, you, when, you, when you make it to glory, when you start sitting on your throne, we, we want a little piece of that. They remember again back in chapter 9, the transfiguration, how glorious of a moment that was, and they want in on a little bit of piece of that. Disciples showed that they'd taken people like the Pharisees as their model of greatness. Those who basked in the recognition of others, demanding the best seats in the house, and that everyone understood that they were number one. They wanted to be on the receiving end of service and greatness, not on the giving end of it. And that's the model that Jesus has been trying to teach them the whole time. Leads me to my first main observation this morning, and that's this. A disciple does not seek for themselves fame and glory. A disciple does not seek for themselves fame and glory. And that's difficult in the society in which we live, isn't it? Because everything about our society today tells us that we deserve a special status above everybody else. We are propped up. We try to prop ourselves up and promote ourselves because we're number one. And everything that we think, say, and do is better than the next person. If you've been reading through the book Multiply, and I hope you have been <laughs> with our church and uh, the, our staff, Francis Chan, he's talking of, in one section here, he's talking about studying the Bible, and he has a great quote on this status, this fame thing related to reading your Bible. He says this, there's a certain status or air of respect reserved for those who know their Bibles well, and rightly so. We should all aspire to know God's word inside and out. It should be on the tip of our tongues and deeply ingrained on our hearts and minds. But take a minute to ask yourself why you want to know the Bible well. God is pleased when we treasure his word, but do you really think he's pleased with your desire to appear intelligent? Does your desire to be the go-to guy who has never stumped really bring him glory? What about your desire to be recognized as the best or the most spiritual person in the room? It's not about studying the Bible too much as if that were possible. It's about your motivation. Too often Christians are motivated by status when we should be motivated by a desire to know God, to be changed by his word, and to love and serve the people around us. Chances are you know someone who knows the Bible, knows the Bible well inside and out. Maybe you've noticed how that person gets treated and you want what he or she has. Competition is a great motivator, but it's the wrong reason to study the Bible. God cares more about your character than your productivity, and let's face it, studying the Bible in order to be better than someone else is ridiculous. A church cannot thrive. A ministry cannot thrive. Christians cannot thrive. If we're constantly fighting and jockeying for positions of power and authority... Verse 38, Jesus begins his response. He says, but Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Notice that has an explanation point at the end of it. He doesn't say, you know, we have this, we have this mindset. We've taught for years and years, meek and mild little Jesus, baby Jesus. That's not the response he gives here. 
He says, you don't know what you're asking. I've just invested in you. I've just told you everything that's going to happen, and you've got the audacity to come and ask me for a favor. You don't know what you're asking. Be careful what you wish for. Are you able to drink from the cup of suffering that I'm getting ready to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I'm about to be baptized with? I have this pink cup. This was the pink cup of Louise Doan. This was my grandmother. And I remember, I've got so many fond memories of her drinking from this cup, taking juices and water and things like that out to my grandpa who had been, who had been working hard in the garden. I remember my grandmother drinking 7-Up from this cup. I inherited this cup, and it means a lot to me. Actually, I think I stole it from my mom and dad's house, but <laughs> hopefully you'll forgive me for that. A lot of fond memories in this cup. Jesus was telling them, James and John, be careful, because that cup you're about to drink, that I'm going to drink, it ain't going to have a lot of fond memories. It's not going to taste very good. He talks about being baptized with his baptism of suffering. And that word baptized comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to submerge. It's why we take people in that baptistry over there and we completely submerge them into the waters of baptism. He's, he's telling them, are you ready? Are you willing to be baptized, baptizo, submerged into this life of calamity and life of trial? Are you ready for that? leads me to my second observation today, and that's this. A disciple has a proper understanding of sacrifice. A disciple has a proper understanding of sacrifice. You might also say surrender. One of my favorite pastors is a guy named, and author and speakers is a guy named Mark Batterson. Mark is a pastor of National Community Church in Washington, D.C. Last year, he put out a book, and it was called, it's entitled, All In. And in that book, he talks about this subject. He says, when did we start believing that God wants to send us to safe places to do easy things? That faithfulness is holding the fort. That playing it safe is safe. That there's, that there's any greater privilege than sacrifice. That radical is anything but normal. Jesus didn't die to keep us safe. He died to make us dangerous. Faithfulness is not holding the fort. It's storming the gates of hell. The will of God is not an insurance plan. It's a daring plan. The complete surrender of your life to the cause of Christ isn't radical. It's normal. It's time to quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. It's time to go all in and all out for the all in all. Jesus invites his followers here to, to join him in becoming great and doing great things, but not the way the world judges greatness, the way he does. And that involves sacrifice. That involves service. Jesus asks these two questions, and then in verse 39, in their, their arrogance, in their ignorance, the, the disciples say in verse 39, oh, yes, yes, Jesus, we're ready, we're able. And then Jesus told them, You'll indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. Now, remember who he's talking to here. He's talking to James, who in Acts chapter 12 is going to be martyred. His, his head, he's going to be beheaded for the cause of Christ. And John, who many theologians think was boiled in a, in a cauldron of hot oil and then sent off to the island of Patmos to be exiled. He says, you're going to drink from this cup. And you're going to be baptized with this baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right hand or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. It's at this time as we go into verse 41 that picture off to the side uh, the disciples, the other ten disciples, and they're sitting there watching this. When the ten other disciples, says in verse 41, heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. That word indignant is, indignant is synonymous with Jealous. Why would they be jealous of this? I tell you why they would be jealous of it because they didn't want to say it, they didn't want to admit to it, but they wanted the same thing that James and John had just asked Jesus for. James and John had just beaten them to the punch. And they were indignant because they'd rather carry a grudge than to carry a cross. And you know, a lot of times what happens, and 
whether it's with the, the disciples or in a business or in a family, a lot of times people can get off on their own tangents and off on their own pages, doing their own thing. And Jesus begins to see this. He, bes- he begins to see that they're not on the same page and they're mad at each other. It says in verse 42, so Jesus called them together. I like, I like sports. To me, he just called a good old-fashioned timeout. And he brought them together. He says, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. Listen. But among you, it must be different. Among you, Christian Fellowship Church, it must be different. He's telling the disciples here, he says, he says, Among you, it must be different. It must be different than those Pharisees that you've been watching. It's got to be different than the Romans, those oppressive Romans that you've been watching. And you've kind of modeled this greatness after, this view of greatness after. Goes on and says, for whoever wants to be a leader among you must first be your what? Servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. The disciples displayed a delight for power and glory and ambition and achievements. But there's so much more to the life of discipleship. Jesus reminds us here that the greatest work ever done The greatest work ever done was accomplished by someone who gave his life for other people. And that, my friends, is the essence of discipleship. Which leads me to my third and final observation today, and that's this. A disciple knows that to share in Jesus' kingdom is to share in Jesus' passion. A disciple knows that to share in Jesus' kingdom is to share in Jesus' passion. I'm reminded of what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 17. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together we're Christ, with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. God saves honor. God bestows honor on those people who willingly carry the, pick up the cross of Christ and carry it on. Who humbly pick up the cross of Christ and carry it on. Putting together a message like this for me is difficult. And I'll tell you why it's difficult. Because whenever, whenever I, when I was studying for this the last couple of weeks, I'm looking at the scripture and I'm trying to make notes on what I should share with y'all. And every time I did, it was like me looking in a mirror and seeing James and John. Because for so many years of my life, for so long, I've been the status seeker. I've been the go-getter. I've been the one who's wanted to achieve so many things, dreaming of success far beyond what everybody else was achieving. When in reality, all I needed to do was have a willing heart, open to what God's call was on my life, and do it. Serve Him sacrificially. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, kind of sums up this, this thing we've been talking about today the costs associated with being a disciple. It says, the life of discipleship can only be maintained so long as nothing else is allowed to come between Christ and ourselves. Neither the law nor personal piety nor even the world. The disciple always looks only to his master, never to Christ and the law, never to Christ and religion, never to Christ and the world. He avoids all such notions like the plague. Only by following Christ alone can he preserve a single eye. His eye rests wholly on the light that comes from Christ and has no darkness or ambiguity in it. 
as the eye must be single, clear, and pure in order to keep light in the body, as hand and foot can receive light from no other source save the eye. As the foot stumbles and the hand misses its mark with, when the eye is dim, as the whole body is in darkness when the eye is blind. So the follower of Christ is in the light only so long as he looks simply to Christ and nothing else in the world. Thus the heart of a disciple must be set upon Christ alone. If the eye sees an object which is not there, the whole body is deceived. If the heart is devoted to the mirage of the world, to the creature instead of the creator, the disciple is lost. Friends, I'm here to tell you, there's a cost to being a disciple. There's a cost to discipleship. It may cost you your resources. It may cost you time. It may cost things out of your busy schedule. It may cost you some relationships. It's cost me relationships even in the last several months. But I'm here to tell you, it is so worth it. It is so worth it. I have three men, three men that, that we walk through life together intentionally. We study the Bible together. We ask each other questions. <laughs> we get together when we don't understand things and we need each other's help. And it costs us. It costs financial resources because all of my guys like to eat. It costs time. Sometimes it means changing schedule around. Oh, when you see God at work in their life. Oh, it's so worth it. Do you want to be a disciple? Maybe today the first step for you is meeting the one who makes disciples, and his name is Jesus. And he came to this earth for one purpose, and that's to shed his blood and to die for your sin. And maybe you're here today and you've never repented of your sin. You've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior. Sometimes we complicate that, and it's as simple as ABC. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus came to this earth and died for those sins Confess him as your Lord and ask him into your life. Maybe you're here today and the next step in discipleship for you is to begin making disciples of other people. If that's you, I want to encourage you. I see Jeff Devine out there right now at our table in the lobby, the discipleship table. Go out there, talk to him. He'll help answer some of your questions. We'll have some elders and staff out there as well. On the inside of your bulletin, there's a card, a welcome card. On the back side of that welcome card, there's a line that says, I want to be discipled. I, I want to be a disciple maker. Maybe one of those boxes you can check off is for you. And we'll be back in touch with you to help you with that. I've asked the band to come out today and to play one final song. It means a lot to me. It's a fairly new release. Lady name. Francesca Battistelli. If you know this song, sing along. If you don't, let the words minister to your heart because they have so much to do with the passage we've read today.